All right, well, welcome all, and thanks very much for joining us. We're going to be dealing with the topic of resilience during challenging times. Uh, Andrew Marty is my name. I'm a psychologist by profession. I was asked by Commerce Ballarat to run this session on resilience, and next week we're also running a session on uh, stress. In other words, how to manage the stress associated with COVID-19. So thanks very much for joining me today. There will be a recorded version of this presentation available and we can also give you a copy of the slides if you're interested in that. So just to cover what we intend to cover today in this resilience presentation, um, as a psychologist, I'm a science-based psychologist. SACS is in a partnership, a research partnership, <clears throat> mainly with Deakin Uni, but our business is what you call a scientist practitioner business. So we undertake primary research and we also then have publications on those topics and we use the findings of that research to drive uh, products that we then create and provide to our clients. Uh, I also have my colleague Georgia Ladner here, so that's her, Georgia waving her hand there, saying hello to everybody. So uh, setting some objectives for today, uh, well I guess anybody who's been to Psychology 101 knows that psychologists are kind of crazy about definitions. I mean, that's a science thing to define things. So we're gonna be giving you a definition of resilience. What is resilience? We'll also be talking to you about why it matters. In other words, what is resilience, but why does it matter? And is it a good thing? Can it be demonstrated in a research sense to be a good thing? We'll be talking about some of the benefits of resilience. And we'll be talking about building resilience. So we'll be giving you some specific techniques to build resilience. So the first question is, what is resilience? And resilience can be held to be a protective factor. So it's a commonly used term, which means that it's to do with positive psychology and positive mental health. So when people have high levels of resilience, they're able to maintain positive levels of mental health and positive levels of psychological well-being, And so the way that that works is that it's a protective factor, <clears throat> pardon me, against mental health problems. So when people are highly resilient, it means that they're less likely to descend into negative psychological conditions like uh, anxiety, depression, those kinds of things. So it's a protective factor against mental health problems. And here is the technical definition of resilience. It's the general capacity for flexible and resourceful adaptation to external and internal stressors. So that was the definition from a fellow by the name of Clonin in 1996. And Clonin came up with this definition, which certainly sounds a bit scientific if you wanna put it that way. But one of the things that we can do from this definition is just to unpack the words here Firstly, resilience is a general capacity, a general capacity, which means that you tend not to be resilient in one part of your life, but lack resilience in another part of your life. Flexible. In other words, people who are truly resilient are able to respond flexibly to the challenges that they encounter in their life. Second, the next word is about being resourceful. So people who are highly resilient tend to be able to find resources to get good outcomes. And then adaptation, we know what that means, but external and internal stressors. Now, of course, we're in the middle of this crisis called COVID-19 and external stressors are things like the disease itself. And it's also things like the economic distress that comes from the disease. Another external stressor, in fact, could be what happens to family relationships or interpersonal relationships when these challenges come up. Those are all external stressors. But of course, of course, there are also internal stressors and internal stressors are things like our psychological state. They're things like whether we are well or ill. They're things like whether we are tired or worn out or whatever, they're all internal stressors. And so if you are truly resilient, you're gonna cope with external and internal stressors. And so that's an important definition. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about the whole area of resilience is that we so often talk these days about a thing called post-traumatic growth. I'm sure that you've all heard of post-traumatic stress, but did you know that there was a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth? Now, post-traumatic growth is the capacity to grow from negative experiences. And I'm just gonna ask you 
This is a thought experiment. I want you to think for a moment of the most developmental thing that ever happened to you. The thing that caused you to learn most in your life. So just reflect, was that an easy thing? In fact, for most people, people grow from the things that are challenging rather than from the things that are easy. And certainly we're starting to see across the world a trend to uh, resilience teaching in schools, resilience upbringing, where schools are seeking to cause students more and more to rely on their own resources. Because if you want a resilient child, the only thing you can do to do that, or the most effective thing, is to show that child that he or she can cope and doesn't really need somebody else to come and solve their problems. So post-traumatic growth rather than post-traumatic stress. Now, just to give you a little bit about the history of this idea of post-traumatic growth, even very significant tragedies like the September 11 tragedy in the United States of America, you may remember that where planes flew into buildings and uh, you know, some two and a bit thousand people were killed. Uh, this led to one of the longest and most powerful longitudinal studies into human well-being that's ever been undertaken in the world because New York has many psychologists and they had really good data on many of the people who were affected by this tragedy before, during and after the tragedy. So they knew about the levels of well-being of people who were associated with this tragedy. And what they discovered is what's been found around the world, that if you have a tragic experience like this, something like 70% of the people who go through this tragic experience are about as psychologically well adjusted as they were prior to the tragedy or worse. In other words, they're about the same or they get worse. But what's really interesting is that 30% of the people who go through these experiences actually get better. Now, what do I mean by better? I mean things like psychological growth. post -heal. quite often after the child recovers, the mother will not only have better relationships with that child, but may well have better relationships with the rest of her family or even people outside the family group. So this is post-traumatic growth. Now, from a psychological point of view, this is fascinating because some people have post-traumatic stress and some people have post-traumatic growth. Now, the people who have post-traumatic growth in general have mastered or at least become capable in this thing called resilience. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what resilience is and what causes it. But the idea of post-traumatic growth, I think, is a really interesting idea rather than post-traumatic stress. Now, crafting, and in France, they call this bricolage. Bricolage means making do with what we have. So when people are highly resilient, what it means is that they craft, they can make do with what's around them, and there they, therefore they uh, don't have to wait for people to solve their problems. They improvise, they use what is at hand. And a gentleman by the name of Kutu studied this uh, going back in 2002. And then there's a thing called grit, which is the hard edge of resilience. Grit is where people persist for a long period of time to achieve a meaningful goal. And that's resilience when it becomes very goal focused. So the crucial role of focus. Here's what we know about resilience and focus. The secret of life is what you focus on. Now, this idea of the secret of life is what you focus on. By the way, that's a quote from me. I can't uh, say that some famous scientist came up with that. The secret of life is what you focus on is all about the degree to which people's well-being is affected by what they focus on. And what they focus on can be helpful to them or damaging to them. And the secret of life being what you focus on, if you focus on things that help you, you are going to have higher levels of psychological well-being if you have a focus on things that make things more difficult for you, then you're going to have lower levels of well-being. So the secret of life is what you focus on. So let's talk about some things that do affect resilience. Optimism and positivity rather than pessimism and negativity. I mean, I'm sure that you have all heard of the glass half full versus the glass half empty. And let me tell you a research finding from the world of social psychology. This particular study was conducted, it's been conducted multiple times, 
But basically what the researchers did in this case is that they matched two samples. This is often done in psychological research. You get two samples, and if you've got one person who's 80 in one sample, you put another person who's 80 in another sample. If you've got five people who are 20, you put five people who are 20 in the other. And so they were matched for age, they were matched for socioeconomic status. They were also matched for levels of well-being. So the researchers studied their levels or measured their levels of well-being and matched these two samples. 200 people uh, in one group and 200 people in another, and both groups were asked to keep a diary. Diary number one was a diary of blessings. So one group of 200 people studied every day. They sat down and they wrote down, let's say three or four good things that happened to them that day. Group number two undertook a diary completion where they wrote down the things that were challenges to them, the bad things that happened to them every day. And the levels of well-being of these people were measured before during and after this study. And what do you think happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The people who kept the challenges diary were in fact significantly worse from a psychological well-being point of view after the study than the people who kept the, uh, the optimism diary or the blessings diary. So much so that if you wanted to conduct this study these days, you may well run into difficulties getting ethics approval in universities because it can be shown that getting people to keep uh, challenges diaries where they write down the bad things that happen to them, that can make their levels of psychological well-being markedly worse. And therefore, it's considered to be harmful to those people to do that. So there's an example of diaries research. Focusing on the positive actually helps people to be more positive. Now, next week, I'm running a session on stress, and I'm going to be talking a fair bit about neurology in that session. But I want to talk a little bit about neurology now. I went to university, and when I went to university, the dominant model of psychology was a thing called behavioral psychology, which sort of said uh, stimulus in, behavior out, and in the middle was a brain, and the brain was called the black box. The black box is black no longer now, largely because we have technology to see what's going on in the human brain. And when we look at what happens in the human brain, we can see the parts that light up and the parts that go quiet. And one of the things that we know is when people are focused on optimistic and positive things, you can actually change the structure of your brain by doing this. So for instance, practicing looking at the things that are blessings for you and keeping track of them can make you grow the neural pathways of being more positive and optimistic. So if you practice these things, you will get better at them. And a number of neuroscientists over the years have demonstrated this. This is something that's not a matter of guesswork. Now, as I said, when I went to university, and admittedly, that was a long time ago, but back in those days, we used to say that plasticity of the brain was only for people who were in growth phases. Now we know that's not true. Plasticity of the brain applies at all phases of a person's life. So a person who is 80 years of age has a certain degree of plasticity. They can learn. If you learn a second language, for instance, what will happen is the speech center of your brain, which is about here, actually on the inside, not on the outside, but the speech center of the brain is about here. If you learn a second language, the speech center of the brain will physically grow. If you stop using that language, the speech center of the brain will contract back to a similar size that it was before you started doing that. So we know that the brain can change and working on things like optimism and positivity and practicing them can actually make you better at those things. And that's a good thing for everybody concerned. It will build your resilience. A focus on solutions rather than emotions. Did you know that venting in the general run of things makes things worse? Because just think of plasticity of the human brain. Firstly, venting, let's, let's define what I mean by that. So you're going to go into your work group and you're going to tell everybody what's wrong and you're going to complain about it. And when you do that, if you've got a, an audience of people listening to you, what will tend to happen is that you'll get a little burst of a thing called dopamine, which is a reward, a reward chemical. It makes you feel good in the moment to vent in front of other people. There's a downside though. Because when you vent, you exercise the part of your brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is the seat of three key emotions, anger, fear, and depression. 
And so because of plasticity of the human brain, venting causes your amygdala to become more powerful and that causes you to be more capable of being angry, fearful, and depressed, which really, when you think of it, is not a good outcome. So the alternative is a focus on solutions. So imagine the situation where something goes wrong. You can tell each other how you feel about it, or you can sit down and come up with a solution. Coming up with a solution tends to make us more resilient because it reaffirms to us that we have a capacity to influence what goes on in our life and it has an effect on our neural pathways, which will make us much more capable of seeing the positive. So a focus on solutions is a very good thing in terms of building resilience. Now, that doesn't mean we never talk about emotions. And next week in particular, when we talk about stress, I will be spending some time talking about how we can manage the challenge, the clinical challenge of high levels of stress. And yes, you do have to talk about some of that, but it's important as quickly as possible once you've settled the person down and made them feel safe that you are moving on to solutions or focus on solutions rather than emotions uh, focus on the future we know that the most resilient people tend to be connected to the future which means that they have a belief in the future they have a liking for the future they have a commitment to the future they feel that they have a future so a focus on the future is again a thing that's worth practicing because it causes people to feel connected with and optimistic about where they're heading in life. Now, when we say a focus on the future, it doesn't require you to focus on three, four, six years down the track. A focus on the future can be as simple as to say, what is it that I'm looking forward to doing tomorrow? What will I be doing the day after that? Focusing on short term, but focusing on the future turns on certain parts of your brain, which are much more likely to cause you to be resilient rather than others. So a focus on the future is a helpful thing. Um, I'm just gonna go back for a moment. One of the things that's worthwhile talking about here, and you'll notice that all of these things have a kind of a positivity angle to them. Positivity versus negativity. I mentioned the diary research of positive versus negative. Many psychologists have been fascinated by the question of the weight of a positive versus a negative. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. If I were to say something negative to you, and by the way, I won't, but if I were to say something negative to you, if I say something positive to you, how much positivity do I have to say in order to improve your situation after I've said something negative to you? So the nature of this research is typically you hook somebody up to a thing called a functional magnetic resonance imaging device, and you can see how the happiness center of the brain glows and you can see how the stress center of the brain glows. And if you say something negative to people, you will see that their level of well-being declines. The happiness center of the brain becomes less active. If you say something positive to people, you will see that the happiness center of the brain becomes active. It starts to glow more. So the question is, is a positive the same as a negative? Because if it were, if I said something positive to you, then one, something negative, then you should end up pretty much where you started out and vice versa if I said a negative and then a positive. It turns out actually that a negative is worth in most cases a multiple of a positive. And that is to say that if I say one negative thing to you, in the case of most people, I'll have to say between three and six positive things to you to get you back where you were before I opened my mouth. So negatives weigh much more heavily on the human psyche than positives. And the reason for that is that as we were evolving in the hunter-gatherer era, if something was bad news, well, bad news can kill you. There's a saber-toothed tiger that can kill you. There's a flood that can kill you. The positive things like, well, there's some food around the corner. Well, that, yeah, that could be really, really helpful and even in, really important in certain circumstances, but it's really the difference between life and death. That, by the way, is why newspapers around the world are full of bad news, because there have been efforts to publish newspapers in the past that have only good news and no one would buy them. People are kind of hooked to bad news. We take a lot of attention to bad news. So if you want to create a resilient workplace, I guess what I'm saying is that resilience comes from having a strong overbalance of positive communications, positive messages rather than negative messages. 
Going back to the venting thing, uh, this is my way of saying Sigmund Freud had it wrong. Sigmund Freud said it's best to vent everything, or he didn't quite say that, that's unfair. He talked about catharsis, how it's good for you to reach down into your inner traumas and vocalize them. Well, there can be some circumstances in which that's a good idea, but if people are coming into your workplace saying negative things and venting about their feelings, two things are gonna happen. Their level of resilience is gonna decline and the well-being of the people around them is going to decline, largely because of the mirror cells that we have in our brains. Every human being has mirror cells in their brains. And you know this because the fact that when you see other people happy, you happy up, that's your mirror cells. They, are, they have evolved to cause you to harmonize with the emotions of other people. And I sometimes use the example of, have you ever seen a really bad public speaker? By the way, uh, don't give me that feedback yet if that's what's happening right now because I've still got about another half an hour to go. But the point is that if you are uh, seeing a really bad public speaker, the, the, the emotional challenge of this is that you feel what it would be like to be that bad public speaker. That's your mirror cells operating. So human beings use their mirror cells to harmonize with the well-being and the emotions of other people. So the balance of positive and negative, if you want a good corporate culture, what you've got to have is lots of good behaviors. That's what corporate culture is. Corporate culture is not mission, vision, values. It's behaviors. Three good behaviors for every bad behavior is probably line ball. Five or six good behaviors for every bad behavior is much more positive. Eight or nine good behaviors for every bad behavior is, again, more positive still. By the way, if anybody's got we're a relatively modestly sized group, if somebody's got a question or something like that, don't hesitate to drop a chat or if you want to uh, comment on something. Now I want to share with you a really important idea from the world of resilience research. This is called locus of control. Now, when you think of locus of control, and uh, it sounds a strange idea. In fact, when I first heard this, it was in a psychology lecture and I thought that the lecturer had said locust, like some giant grasshopper of control. No, locus means where is control. And so I have a diagram here to explain the locus of control. And I noticed that uh, a number of people who've appeared since we started the presentation, just to say what I said at the start, you can get a recorded version of this if you're interested. And also we will send you the slides. So feel free to take notes if you want, but you will get a chance to get hold of these materials. So this is the person, this is a person, if you like. Now, this is control. That's the locus of control. So a person who has an internal locus of control is a person who believes that they can influence their world. In counseling, sometimes the term that's used is does this person have agency? Agency means I can influence what's going on in my world. And when a person has agency, they can do that. This is an external locus of control. This is where a person believes that they don't have agency. It seemed to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind, never knowing who to cling to when the rain set in. Now, I didn't write that one. That was a gentleman by the name of Elton John. And, but in his song, Norma Jean, he was talking about somebody who was, who had very little locus of control or internal locus of control, had a strong external locus of control. Now, most positive psychology methods of increasing people's levels of resilience have an element of taking an external locus of control and turning it into an internal locus of control. So how do we do this? We're gonna give you some techniques, but firstly, we're gonna ask the question, does it matter? So there are a number of benefits of resilient employees. For instance, benefit number one, resilient employees are psychologically healthier. In other words, they tend to be depressed less often, they tend to be anxious less often. So if we recruit people who are naturally resilient. And I'm gonna suggest that there are personality types which are more naturally resilient, then that's good. But if we help people to build their resilience, then that's also really, really helpful. People who are highly resilient tend to have superior problem solving and reasoning skills. In other words, they can solve problems better. They tend to have higher intellectual motivation. Now that might sound a little bit high flown, but let me describe what that means. People who have higher intellectual motivation are people who like to think deeply about things and who like to solve problems in an ongoing long-term sense, 
rather than just put out the local blaze, you know, that firefighting solve the immediate problem kind of an approach. So higher intellectual motivation is a good thing. They're better able to remain calm in stressful situations. So that's good. Uh, they tend to be able to follow their own problem solving initiatives. So rather than needing to be rescued, they're the sort of people who can solve their own problems. And I think that that's a really core element of the definition of resilience. People who are truly resilient don't wait for a savior. They are people who are able to solve their own problems and to take their own initiatives to do that. They're also able to develop their own coping strategies to stress. Um, it's sometimes said that when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. And uh, in Victoria, that hasn't been really easy in recent times, particularly if you've been in Metro Melbourne. But in general, shopping aside, people who are highly resilient build their own coping strategies. Some might say, okay, well, I want to undertake exercise. Some might do it through socializing. Some might do it through sitting down and working out solutions. People work out their own coping strategies. And they tend to have healthy personality profiles. So resilient people tend to be healthy in terms of their personality. And that, by the way, has a significant impact on things like job performance. Other benefits, resilient employees tend to cope well in social situations so that they can cope with a wide range of contacts. So if they're in roles like customer service, that's a good thing. In addition, they tend to be more thoughtful in planning, more achievement orientated, more organized. This gentleman by the name of Fayombo has undertaken a lot of research in the area of resilience, as has Freiburg. And they also tend to possess an internal locus of control. Now, the internal locus of control, you can hire people who are like that, but you can also cause people to have more of an internal locus of control based on what you focus on. So where does resilience come from? Well, like most things in life, it comes from a mixture of nature and nurture. So nature and nurture, I'm sure you've heard of this nature-nurture differential. Uh, the term nature-nurture was in fact invented by a gentleman by the name of Francis Galton somewhere around 1880, 1860 to 1880. Galton was the nephew of Charles Darwin. And so he had a particular interest in genetics, which is why nature-nurture. Uh, for those of you who are interested, he also invented the correlation coefficient, which is a remarkable thing, the very earliest ones of those. He invented the term questionnaire, he invented trait and state, which are classic ideas in psychology. Smart guy, but nature nurture. So cognitive ability, how smart you are, can have an effect on how resilient you are. And the reason that's on the nature side is that that appears to be somewhere around 70 to 80 percent genetically determined. You'll get arguments from researchers. But we know, for instance, that identical twins separated at birth who have never met each other tend to have higher correlations in their cognitive ability scores than non-identical twins who grow up in the same family. Now, if you do enough of this kind of research, you can map the genetic component of cognitive ability. And that's how we come to the 70 to 80 percent estimate, which is what many geneticists would say. Personality is also heavily genetically determined. We know that personality tends in most people, the big parts of personality settle at around about three years of age. Now we discovered this relatively recently. Uh, it had been said for years that personality kind of settles in human beings at somewhere between 16 and 23, 24 years of age. But a study in New Zealand called the Dunedin Study of Human Development, which was undertaken at the University of Otago, that study is now about 45 years old. And a gentleman by the name of Silva, S-I-L-V-A, all those years ago decided he was going to track down and measure the development of 1,000 human babies. And he undertook what was the biggest study of human development ever known, kind of like 7up, but with real science associated with it. And so he measured things every year for those babies, year by year, from 45 years ago. Silver now, sadly, is no longer with us, but the study continues. And one of the things that they did in the Dunedin study is that they observed three-year-old children, and they had a protocol to assess the personality of those three-year-old children. So does this child like to be with other children, or is this child shy and retiring? Is this child a risk taker, or is it a child that's kind of cautious in avoiding risk? Does this child work hard and 
do what they think is the right thing, or are they relatively more relaxed in life? And what they discovered is that from those profiles that were taken all those years ago, when the Dunedin kids turned 40, they psych tested them again, or actually psych tested them, uh, they'd psych tested them a few times, but what they found was extremely strong correlations between the observations at three years of age and 40 years down the track, remarkable stuff. So we know that personality tends to settle very early in life. And once more from twin studies, we know that there's a strong genetic component to that. So this starts to imply, of course, that an element of resilience is simply genetic. And it is. We know from the combination of cognitive ability and personality that some people are likely to be more resilient than others. But the point that I would like to make is that whatever your natural setting for resilience, you can build skills to make yourself more resilient. You can have experiences which will cause you to be more resilient. And by the way, challenging experiences are the ones that tend to make people more resilient rather than easy experience. And finally, your attitudes and values can make you more resilient. So let's look at some of the things that we've found about the nature side firstly. So this is the work of a lady by the name of Sonia Lubomirsky. Sonia is a positive psychologist. So she's one of these psychologists that focuses on how to optimize human conditions. A uh, big and rapidly growing school in the world of psychology is positive psychology. I guess the idea of psychology historically was take, to take people who were minus 30, i.e. depressed, anxious, phobic, that kind of thing, and to get them back to zero. The idea of positive psychology is that zero is not good enough. We wanna get people from zero to plus 10, plus 20, plus 30. And Sonia Lubomirsky is a representative of this world of psychology. Now, you'll notice that we're talking about happiness here, and you might wonder, what has happiness got to do with resilience? Well, it turns out that if you work to optimize the happiness in your life, you will be more resilient. There is a link between the amount of positive emotions that you have in your life and your resilience. In other words, having lots of happiness in your life can make you cope better when negative things happen. And look at the diagram. This is from a series of studies from Sonia Lubomirsky and also analysis of other people's research. She says that the genetics is 50%. Well, I'd say it's probably a little more, I'd say 60, 70%, but who cares? It's, we're both agreeing that it's around about the majority. Then stuff that happens to the environmental factors, that results in about 10% of your levels of happiness. And the stuff that you make happen, intentional activities can account for 40%. So let's say if it's 50% genetic and 40% intentional activities, you can increase your resilience enormously to what happens in the world by virtue of the stuff that you make happen. You know, even if I'm right and it's 70%, you uh, still got a vast amount of what you can do in life to increase your levels of happiness and therefore increase your levels of resilience. So let's talk about personality. Some components of personality that affect resilience. The first and one of the most important is a thing called the emotional stability. Some people are naturally emotionally stable and some people are naturally emotionally unstable. So when people are emotionally stable, what it means is that they have a natural tendency not to have very loud emotions in their head. Other people, relatively minor things are seen as being very upsetting and very confronting. So when people have low levels of emotional stability, what it means is that relatively minor events upset them a lot. And I can't see your faces, but I bet you're picturing people as I'm telling this story. Now, there was a time when emotional instability was called neuroticism. It's more often called emotionality these days. And we know that uh, it's negatively related to resilience. So the more emotional you are, the less likely you are to be resilient. And it does relate to a thing called emotion-focused coping versus task-focused coping. Task-focused coping is more often these days called solution-focused coping, but emotion-focused coping is where you tell each other how you feel. Task-focused coping is where you come up with solutions. And we know that people who are highly emotionally unstable tend to be more likely to focus on emotion-focused coping rather than task-focused coping. Now, one of the things that's really important to know, did you know that people who are most like each other tend to be most attracted to each other? In fact, 
there's an area called assortative mating. And this is in social psychology where you look at who marries whom. And in fact, if you look at the political views of people who get married, the correlation is something like 0.9 in political views. In other words, uh, yes, you do get communists marrying Trump supporters, but actually I'm not sure that's ever happened, but you do get, let's say for argument's sake, you can get Trump supporters marrying communists, but it's just really, really rare. So people who are politically conservative tend to marry people who are completely politically conservative. People who are politically progressive tend to marry progressives. And so the same goes with personality types. Extroverts tend to marry extroverts. Introverts tend to marry introverts. Yes, I know there are cases across populations where this won't happen. But if you look at thousands of people, people tend to get together with whom they're stable, uh, similar. So what that means is when people are emotionally unstable in a workplace, they often seek out other people who are emotionally unstable and they get together and form what you might call an emotional wallowing hole. You know, they get to tell each other how bad everything is. And, and you can't possibly be wrong in that situation. So that's emotional stability and emotional instability. Personality, continued conscientiousness. We know that people who are conscientious tend to be more highly resilient. They tend to have greater impulse control. They tend to be more organized. So it's a good predictor of resilience. So uh, it's also a good predictor of performance in the workplace. And in this particular study by Fayombo, he found that 21% of resilience was conscientiousness. And he also found that the more unhealthy the personality factor, such as high neuroticism, the less resilient the individual. Extroversion. Now, I'm an introvert and I am famous for not particularly wanting to congratulate extroverts for the way they are. I got absolutely no problem with extroverts. Extroverts are absolutely indispensable in a diverse business. But I must grudgingly confess that I have to accept that, yes, extroverts are in general more resilient than us introverts. They're not massively so, but they have an advantage of naturally reaching out to other people. And as the old saying goes, a problem shared is a problem halved. And if you are upset about something, filling uh, warm friendships and associations with other people can be very helpful. So yes, that does relate. And social support, as we know, can relate. So if you want a resilient personality, what you're looking for is low emotionality, high conscientiousness, particularly this thing, prudence, where people are being thoughtful about what they are going to do about something. And finally, extroversion, but liveliness is the degree to which somebody is optimistic, cheerful, positive. And certainly in a study that Simon Albrecht from Deakin University and myself had published going back a couple of years ago, we found that liveliness, this chirpy, cheerful, optimistic thing, was just about the best predictor of resilience that we could find. Yes, emotionality and conscientiousness had a big impact, but being optimistic, and certainly introverts can be very optimistic, that can be really helpful. So there's some personality characteristics associated with resilience. Cognitive ability, how smart you are. Studies with children suggest that yes, high IQ can enhance resilience. In other words, when people are smart, it can make them more resilient. Largely, I suspect, because it gives them the capacity to come up with a range of solutions. So when people are highly intelligent, they can dream up a range of solutions. But it turns out that if you have high levels of emotionality, uh, high IQ could actually make you less resilient because the high emotionality tends to make you fret and the high IQ makes you a genius for fretting. So it's almost like you lie there in bed and if you weren't so smart, you could dream up four things that would go wrong. But if you've got a high IQ, you can dream up 20 things that can go wrong and remember them. So it turns out that highly emotional geniuses can be a little bit of a problem from a resilience point of view. But also we know IQ is an excellent predictor of work performance. So low IQ can suggest higher levels of work pressure. So nurture. Now, the things that can cause people to be more resilient, what can we do to build resilience? Firstly, values. It's been shown that people who have strong value systems. So if you work for an organization that clearly stands for certain things, there are certain things that are good and certain things that are bad in this organization. We know what's good. We know what's bad. That's good because people, when they know what their organization stands for or their team stands for, we know that values match makes for higher levels of resilience. And if your values suit the group that you belong to, that's helpful. But 
above all else, as long as we're clear about what this group stands for. So if you're in an organization where it seems to make decisions one way this time, another way, another time, that is likely to cause people to have lower levels of resilience. And so values, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but we know that there are several values that are important. So benevolence is about wanting to help other people. And if, for instance, you are a highly benevolent person, but you work for an organization where everything is about achievement, in other words, getting ahead, achievement doesn't mean getting things done. Achievement in this case means getting ahead. Uh, if I am highly benevolent and the organization I work for is highly achievement orientated, that may be a mismatch. So this is a recruitment technique. You can measure resilience on the way in if you want to recruit. And I'm just going to show you some population findings about resilience. Resilience by industry. This was based on a sample of some two and a half thousand people from memory. And you find that the most resilient sectors were property and business services. So culture and recreation services are kind of close. And the lowest was construction, interestingly. And in a way, what you see is that the top end here, these tend to be quite people oriented businesses. And the ones that are more to do with things tend to be less resilient. So there's an interesting finding on resilience by industry. Resilience by age. We see here that there is a lower level of resilience in younger people than older people, but this was not found to be statistically significantly different in our study. But on the other hand, one of the things that we do know, there have been a number of studies that show that resilience in the Western world is declining in young people. The Western world being the United States of America, uh, Scandinavia, Middle Europe, Australia, UK, those sorts of places. It's declining. And we know that by very reliable data. So Gillespie 2019 published a big study on this where he showed a meta-analytical analysis. So why are young people becoming less resilient? By the way, we work in the area of workforce planning and we have found in a number of clients, organizations that used to ask young people to do certain jobs feel that they can no longer ask those young people to do the same jobs because they just can't cope. So that's more evidence about decline in resilience. Seems to be two things. One, we'll call it cosseting. And there is a book, and it's this is not quite the term. Uh, it's something called something like the cosseting of the American brain. It's not cosseting, it's a word like that. And it's all about the degree to which uh, very uh, protective parenting causes kids to believe that they can't cope with the world. There's a a resilience teaching movement across the world. I mentioned this earlier, and that's really to try to address this issue. So overprotective parenting sends a message to the child that the world is a dangerous place and you can't cope with that world. That seems to be a driver. And also screens. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about mindfulness in just a second. Mindfulness is a technique that can improve resilience. And we know that if you're immersed in a fantasy world of screens all the time, that's the opposite of mindfulness. And we know that people who are spending a lot of time on screens tend to be more anxious and therefore less resilient. So the estimate of why all this is happening has been those things. So let's talk about some techniques to build resilience. And so we're gonna finish off the last 15 minutes or so by talking about some positive psychology activities which have been shown to increase levels of resilience in individuals and groups. So you can do these at an individual level and you can do it as a group as well. First one, re re reducing focus on the past and concentrating on the future, making plans about how to get there. So you want to have a team development activity. Why not get the team together and decide, all right, well, and by the way, when I say get together, this works beautifully on technology such as Zoom. It works kind of okay on Teams because Teams doesn't have the breakout room capability of Zoom, but never mind. What you do is you get people to define what they think the perfect version of this team would be. What's the best this team could possibly be? And it's best as the boss, if you don't come up with that, you cause the staff to come up with that, but then you make plans about how to get there. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do to make ourselves the best team that we can possibly be, whatever that means, whether it's supportive or whether it's successful or whatever, whatever we wanna be, Let's make plans about how to get there. That's a really successful team building activity. By the way, team building activities like going away and uh, bungee jumping, whitewater rafting, 
you know, they tend to build relationships which are not work related. The best team development activities to cause people to have high levels of teamwork at work are things that focus on the workplace. Fixing and improving the workplace tends to bond people at work. I'm not saying don't do the outside of work activity things that can show a different aspect to people, but the best way of improving engagement and morale in a team is to cause that team to improve their own workplace. Really powerful stuff. I mentioned the diary activities, gratitudes versus challenges. So why not run a gratitude diary? This is a thing called the three blessings. This is a Martin Seligman activity. Martin Seligman is a positive psychologist from the United States of America. He was one of the authors of what's called the Positive Psychology Manifesto, which is a description of psychology as something which is targeted at human thriving rather than simply helping people to overcome disabilities like phobias or anxieties. I mean, that's really important, but they believe, and I believe that if you help people to go to that plus 20, plus 30, that's a really positive thing. So Seligman started out his career researching a thing called learned helplessness in children. Learned helplessness is very sad. Kids who have learned helplessness tend to be passive, tend to not believe in their own strength. They tend to have very, very low self-esteem and they tend to be somewhat un, uh, underperforming in terms of academic terms. So Seligman wanted to figure out how to overcome learned helplessness in children. And one of the things that he found worked was blessings exercises. So how this works is before you go to bed tonight, write down three good things that happened to you in the course of the day. Now, if you're an accountant or an economist, you might put them in the spreadsheet, that's fine. It doesn't matter, but it does appear to be really important to see it in print. And the reason is that you're sending messages to multiple parts of your brain when you see it in black and white in front of you. It doesn't have to be black and white. You can put it in chartreuse if you want, but the point is seeing it written seems to make a difference. Gratitude exercises work. So you write down the three good things that happened to you that day. You wake up the next day and you look at the good things that happened to you the day before and you remind yourself that you're gonna do the same activity that night. If you do this every day, and by the way, this is gonna take what, five minutes or something like that. And in fact, uh, in a different structure, what I often do in these sessions is get people to do this, you know, to get them to write down three blessings and ask them how they feel about it. And, and some people will say, you know, it's really difficult. And I always say to people who find it difficult, in that case, you are blessed because you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of this activity. If you do this, you will build the neural pathways of gratitude and that will cause you to be more resilient. So in Seligman's research and the research of others after this technique was developed, it can be shown that people who are depressed can reduce their depression by as much as a combination of drugs and counseling simply by doing these three blessings, five, 10 minutes a day, well spent. Learned optimism exercises such as three anticipations. If people are stressed, I often suggest that they do the three blessings every day. And I often suggest that they do a learned optimism exercise, maybe once a week. Three anticipations is just, what am I looking forward to? So I write down, okay, well, you know, this week, I'm looking forward to doing this, this, and this. You know, these are things I like to do, things I think are meaningful. You could look further afield. It might be things like holidays. It might be things like other events, birthdays, marriages, whatever. But practicing optimism builds the neural pathways of optimism. And when you build these neural pathways and you keep them alive and active, you will find that you become a happier and more positive person and therefore build your resilience. Acts of generosity. We're often told that we live in a very selfish time. And I don't wanna comment philosophically on whether we live in a selfish time or not, but I do know that generosity is good for you. People who have depression, quite often their therapists these days are prescribing random acts of generosity. Go out into the world and do kind things to other people. Now, we know that when people do this, their levels of well-being improve. They become less anxious, they become more confident, they become happier. Why? You remember that my diagram where I made the rather weak joke about the candle in the wind, the diagram about an external versus an internal locus of control. If you are able to undertake acts of generosity, you can't possibly be a victim. 
it's a way of reaffirming to yourself that you have this internal locus of control. Very powerful to undertake acts of generosity. So here's another team building exercise. Get your team together and ask them, what are generous things that we can do for other people? I particularly like to do this, by the way, when a group feels that they are oppressed by somebody else. Now, what I like to do is to say, how are we gonna help our oppressors? I must confess, people think I'm insane when I suggest this to them, but if you do something generous to your oppressors, a couple of things are likely to happen. One is that your oppressors might like you more. Second, again, it's powerful. It's gonna change your relationship with oppressors. If you don't like the oppressor bit, fine, leave that to one side, but acts of generosity are good for you. That is why of all of the participation activities across the world, a thing called volunteering is particularly popular. Generosity is good for you, makes you happier, and it gives you higher levels of confidence. Signature strength exercises. Signature strength exercises are where you identify the things that you are uniquely good at. Now, the word signature there is all about your signature is uniquely you, right? I mean, we practice to become good at signing our name in such a way that it looks like nobody else's signature. So some of our strengths are uniquely ours. And if you sit down and write down your signature strengths, you will make yourself more resilient for a while by doing so. But if you then follow up and make sure that you use these signature strengths, you will again increase your resilience. So signature strength exercises are really powerful to increase people's levels of well-being and resilience. Now I'm gonna give you a website that you might like to go to. I mentioned Martin Seligman, S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N. And Seligman has a website called Authentic Happiness. And on Authentic Happiness, he has a couple of signature strength questionnaires. He's got a sort of a medium length one and a short one. But if you fill in that questionnaire, it will give you a report about your signature strengths and it will be useful for you to use those. This is also another really good group activity. Get your team together, ask your team, hey, what are we really good at? Let's vote on the things that we think we're really good at. And let's make decisions about how we can use these strengths to make ourselves as successful as we can possibly be. Those are signature strength exercises and they improve resilience. Mindfulness activities, including meditation. I'm going to give you, uh, tell you about a very brief meditation. This is something that's being used a lot in the children's early childhood and adolescence sector at the moment. It's a mindfulness activity, which is called five, four, three, two, one. Now, mindfulness works because it's really about practicing being in the here and now. The idea of mindfulness is that most of us, let's say we have a hundred units of mental energy to use on any task. Most of us don't use 100 units of mental energy on that task. What we tend to do is we tend to use whatever is left over after we use certain amounts of our mental energy on a thing called narrative. Narrative is where we're telling ourselves something about what we're doing. Now, the narrative can be very unhelpful. I mentioned about public speaking before. Many people are frightened of public speaking and it's often the narrative that gets in the way. The narrative can be things like, you know, I'm just not good at public speaking. The narrative can be that person in the front row isn't listening. The narrative can be, I should have prepared more. All of those things get in the way. So if that consumes 30 to 40% of your mental energy whilst you're trying to give your presentation, well, that's not good. You're carrying a burden, aren't you? So the best thing is to be in the here and now. If you want to give a good presentation, the best thing is to think deeply about what you're going to say next, to be ready to deal with whatever comes up, to be in the here and now. The old fashioned way of dealing with these issues used to be to try to suppress them. Suppression was considered to be a good tactic, but now we know about plasticity of the human brain. Anything in the brain that's opposed will tend to strengthen. So don't fight the narrative, direct your attention away from it. And mindfulness activities help to do this. So five, four, three, two, one. The reason I mention this is very simple. You might even like to do this, but the way it works is that we start out with our eyes open and we look around the room and we notice five things we can see. You just look at those five things. Now, when you're doing these activities, thoughts will come. Don't fight them. 
notice them, but let them drift away. Try to be in the here and now as you notice the five things that you want to look at. The four, you close your eyes for four. We're going to ask you to notice four things that you can feel, four sensations. It could be the temperature in the room. It could be the pressure of the seat. It could be your clothes. It could be whatever. You're going to notice four things. The three is all about what you can hear. You open your ears and you try to hear three different sounds. The two is about what you can smell. And we're going to ask you to notice two smells. And all of this, apart from the first one, is done with eyes closed. And the final one is one that's the taste that you have in your mouth. So we ask you to reflect on the taste that you have in your mouth. Now, I run this activity with groups all the time, and they tell me that it's something that tends to, as the hippies like to say, centers them. But as well as that, it does tend to cause people to be more in the moment. Practicing this, and by the way, in mindfulness theory, this is where it's all heading. Short, quick, adaptable forms of mindfulness. Uh, you don't have to meditate 45 times a day or 45 minutes a day rather to be mindful at doing these activities. You can imagine you could do this two or three times a day and that can help slow down, become more in the moment. Now, once more, because of plasticity of the human brain, if you practice mindfulness activities, you start to increase the way that you're in the moment and decrease the noise that you're getting in your life. And that increases resilience. And finally, forming collaborative group work groups to work together to create an ideal future. So that's sort of like the first one. So there's some positive psychology techniques that you might like to try. So by way of summary and conclusion, resilience matters. It's got an individual trait component. It also has a developmental component. Local characteristics like job, team, leader, a driver of engagement, which is a driver of resilience, There are activities which can build grit and resilience. And now I'm going to ask you to think about that over the next few days. How are you going to apply these? Thank you very much for spending some time with me today. I hope that that's been of help to you. And if you love poll, thanks for coming. May the rest of your day be extremely resilient. I've just launched the poll and uh, we'll be in touch with copies of the notes and you'll have the opportunity to record to get holdings of the recordings if you want that.